It is time for questions to the Minister of Justice, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. George Robison. Mr. Robison. Question one, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, an outline business case for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison was approved by DFP on the 9th of January this year. I met with the then Minister of Finance and Personnel on the 28th of April to discuss capital funding for delivery of the prison estate strategy. Until there is certainty on the capital available in the next spending review, it is not possible to give a commitment to deliver an eight-year construction program. Securing the necessary capital will determine the timeline for the development of the new prison at McGilligan. My officials will complete the necessary bid to DFP to secure capital funding this summer. Well, Mr. Robinson, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. <clears throat> Would the Minister agree that, given the continuing prisoner rise in the population at HMP McGilligan to near maximum levels, it is essential that redevelopment of the prison is uh, concluded at the earliest possible date for both prisoners and staff well-being? Well, I certainly understand it's important that we should be able to proceed with the programme for McGilligan. It's also important that we, predecess, uh, we proceed with some of the capital work required at McGabry and with a facility for women and all that in the context of the difficult financial circumstances the executive as a whole faces. Well, Mr. Pat Rams. Yeah, for, further to, to the member, could I ask the, the Minister, is there any intent of carrying out a phased introduction of, the, of developments taken on security and educational needs of the prisoners within the uh, McGilligan? Well, certainly Mr Ramsey makes a valid point in terms of the scale of the redevelopment that is planned, which will be over a period of a significant time scale, potentially up to eight years. Um, the, the issues, frankly, are that some of the residential accommodation is probably the most urgent priority, given things like the lack of sanitation. It's possible to do some of the learning and skills operations in less than ideal buildings, but frankly, I don't think we can continue to expect people to live in temporary buildings and listen to huts. Well, Mr. Cahill, Walsh. Thank you, Minister, for his answers. Uh, the, the Department were to engage with stakeholders uh, in the area. Uh, can the Minister give us an update on how the, the progress there? Well, certainly, Mr. Hoshin is, is right that the Department was to engage and did engage with uh, stakeholders, including uh, local businesses and including local councils, in terms of providing opportunities for rehabilitation. I mean, certainly, my understanding at the moment is that there are 30 uh, prisoners from Foilview, the semi open unit, who are out working regularly in the community uh, with charities such as Bernardo's, Riding for the Disabled Association, um, with businesses. Uh, with churches and a variety of other things. There, there are placements with the Health and Social Care Trust in both Coleraine and Grey Steel. And there are also three current prisoner placements with Causeway Coast and Glens Council, which builds on the work which was done originally with the three councils of Limavady, Coleraine and Balamani, as they then were. So all of those are good opportunities of work being done. But one of the key factors of keeping the prison at McGilligan was to build on those lo local opportunities. And I'm pleased to see that we have made progress over the last couple of years. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much. Speaker, can I ask the Minister how much has the finance figures changed for this redevelopment since the initial costs were actually put in for the project? Um, I think the answer to any capital programme in terms of things starting at a, an early phase and being considered over a period of years is that costs will increase. And part of the issue is because of the higher expectations of the facilities that will be provided. I don't have the figures immediately before me, but I will certainly write to the member and give the, the current update on the figures. Uh, it is certainly a very significant programme, but it is required in order to, to ensure that McGilligan can fulfil its responsibilities of rehabilitating prisoners and not merely incarcerating them. Call Mr Jim Allister. Um, within the priorities of the department as to capital spends on prisons, could the minister tell us where the McGilligan project ranks? Well, the reality is, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I've just said, and I'll repeat to Mr Allister, that there are requirements in, three, in all three of the prison units. There's a specific requirement for a proper facility for women uh, to build on the work which is currently being done in Ash House in Hyde Bank Wood, and with the step-down facility being built elsewhere on the Hyde Bank Wood site. There's a specific need for more residential accommodation and a plan for a significant cell block at McGabry. 
and there is a need for a complete rehabilitation of McGilligan, which has effectively only one modern residential block, and the rest of it is still largely based on temporary buildings which were put up in the 1970s. So all of those have to be considered together, and the prison service has a plan for phasing all three of those operations, but clearly it is a significant issue for DFP and the executive what funding is available. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson for a question. Question number two, Mr. I've had no meetings specifically on social investment bonds, but my officials continue to explore potential options in this area. DFP is currently working with departments to explore opportunities to pilot alternative financing models for public service delivery, including social impact bonds, and on the development of suitable procurement models. Social impact bonds are indeed a means of attracting private funds to finance interventions designed to achieve social outcomes, as the expected output of a social impact bond is success in improving social outcomes. There would be a requirement to meet outcome payments to private sector investors if outcomes are achieved. The next step for relevant organisations is to consider the outcomes and affordability. My officials will continue to liaise with officials in DFP and elsewhere to further explore opportunities in this area. Call Mr. Wilson for supplementary. I welcome the, uh, the uh, positive uh, response from the Minister regarding this, especially at a time when the public budgets are under pressure uh, to uh, find ways of attracting private investment would be very important. One of the groups which would benefit if such impact bonds were introduced would be Sport Changes Lives, which has had a dramatic impact on uh, um, problems at interface areas. However, there is a requirement for gap funding for that group until such times as impact bonds are in place. Can he give us an assurance that, given the good work and the response which there has been from the PSNI, that he will seek in the monitoring round to ensure that sufficient funds are made available to, to keep those projects going in the interim period? Well, I appreciate entirely the point Mr Wilson makes about sport changes life. He, of course, should declare an interest that's based in his constituency, and one of his key projects was done in my constituency, and in no doubt had a very significant effect. The unfortunate reality is, given the pressures on my department, I'm not sure it is possible to prioritise even such positive and worthwhile community projects as we look at the June monitoring round, given all the other pressures which exist on core services of the department. But I would certainly look to see how we relate not just to Sport Changes Lives, but the other NGO partners that we have. Mr Oliver Mike Mullen. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what initiative is progressing with uh, towards the taking down of interface walls? Well, I'm really not sure, Deputy Speaker, how, th how that sits in uh, with the concept of social investment bonds, but I will happily um, explain to the House that work continues uh, between officials in my department and community groups in a number of interface areas in Belfast, in Derry, uh, and in Lurgan Portadown area, all of which is seeking to build the, the confidence in the communities on either side of interfaces, which would allow the removal of structures or indeed the opening up of structures. And we are uh, continuing to make progress in that respect, both in things like over, uh, longer opening hours of gates and the fact that there are now seven fewer structures under the control of the Department of Justice than when justice was devolved. Ms Judith Cochran. Question number three, please. My department is engaged in a wide range of work to reduce offending by working to rehabilitate people who have offended in order to build a safer society. In September last year, I approved the creation of the new Reducing Offending Directorate to focus on ensuring effective collaboration and partnership working across the justice system in order to reduce offending. Establishing effective ways in which we can support desistance is central to the work of the new Directorate, and I will shortly be publishing a strategy which outlines my department's commitment to promoting desistance from crime. Research indicates that there are several factors that can support the process of desistance including securing and engaging in employment, maintaining relationships with family and community, and having hope and motivation to change. In prison custody, the needs of the individual are balanced alongside their risks to create a dynamic personal development plan which focuses on improving their motivation and their capacity to address their offending behavior. Complementary to this ongoing work is the establishment of a partnership between the prison service, Belfast Met, and Northwest College which will work to improve educational attainment and the employment prospects of prisoners. 
The opening of the Barn House facility has also provided a low security pre release facility to test the capacity to work in the community and engage with employment or learning opportunities. My department is also, also thinking innovatively about the best ways to support offenders in gaining future employment. In recent weeks, we've seen the creation of an in-house cafe in Hyde Bank and the establishment of a social enterprise to employ young parents who have offended. This is just a flavour of the significant work which my department has been undertaking to reduce offending and to protect the public. However, I recognise that there is still more that can be done, and my department will continue to explore innovative and effective ways of reducing offending and making Northern Ireland safer. Ms Cochrane for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, in, in your answer, Minister, you referred uh, to the partnership between the Prison Service and Belfast Met and North West Regional College. Is this a, a new model for the delivery of learning and skills? Uh, yes, Deputy Speaker, it's a significant new mod model. In a sense, it's similar to the work which has been done around health care, where the expectation is being delivered that health care is better provided by the South Eastern Trust, a specialist health and social care provider, rather than in-house by the prison service. On exactly the same basis, the new contract, which will result in the creation of 33 new jobs in order to provide learning and skills opportunities by the two colleges within the three prisons, is a key way of building on the skills which exist in FE colleges and putting them to the best use of those who are in the care and the custody of the prison service. There's a range of issues being covered, including uh, both academic and vocational training, right from learning and skills, uh, uh, sorry, numeracy, literacy, um, essential skills issues, right through to degree level work, which is now being done within the prisons. And certainly some of the practical issues are showing very positive results, even at this early stage. Mr. Patsy McGlough. Uh, I would ask Ken Corley, I guess, we have in the Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, um, for his answers up to this point. Um, could the Minister uh, give some indication at all, please, in terms of the, the financial cutbacks at his department and their, their uh, impact upon the lakes of Niagara and their programmes to help reduction of offenders? Has there been any evaluation done of, as the potential? of a detrimental potential as a consequence of those with key stakeholder organisations such as Niagara. Well, Mr McGloan highlights yet another effect of the difficult financial circumstances we are in. There is no doubt that there is a detrimental effect on the services provided by some of our NGO partners, Niagara and Extern being two of the key ones in terms of the rehabilitation of offenders, because of the cutbacks in grant funding. And that comes after four years in which grants to the voluntary sector were by and large protected, and in circumstances in which the most significant cuts, as I frequently say from this point, are being made to the core of the department. But nonetheless, it has not been possible to continue to, uh, to fund at the level that we were funding last year in this year. And it was also, of course, complicated by the issue of European social funding, uh, where Niagara was not successful in its bid for its ongoing work in that respect. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, reducing offending and indeed reducing reoffending uh, can often be achieved by reviewing the severity of the sentences available to the judiciary. How regularly does the Minister do that? I think, Deputy Speaker, it's probably uh, safe to say that on virtually occasion, every occasion that a Minister produces the possibility for further offences being created, uh, then the appropriate level of sentences for new offences is a consideration of my department to ensure that matters are kept uh, in balance between different offences of a broadly similar nature. And there is ongoing work in the department to keep an eye on that and also to review those kind of issues as they relate particularly to other jurisdictions within these islands to ensure that there is a broad comparability. But I stress broad comparability, not necessarily absolute equivalence. Mr Sean Lynch. Um, I get to ask Ken Collier. Uh, can the Minister give an update on what wider work has been done across government in regard to reoffending? Well, Mr. Lynch correctly highlights that the issue of reducing reoffending is not an issue which can be handled by my department alone. As I pointed out, issues like housing, uh, issues like health and social care matters, issues like employment and training are all key issues. And we seek to work in partnership with other departments, as, for example, the partnership with Dell and the two colleges over the issue of job skills training and the routes into further employment. 
but that does require a joined up approach and that is an issue where we are seeking to work within the department alongside other executive departments which have direct responsibilities for providing those services. Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you Deputy Speaker and uh, thank the Minister for that. Would the Minister agree that it is very difficult to get the, the level of offending now due to the number of crimes going unreported because of the, the lack of uh, bringing crimes to a conclusion? Well, I am not sure there is necessarily a, you know, a great issue about reporting or, in, in essence, as Mr Elliott suggested, of reporting getting worse. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no doubt the case that some criminal offences have historically gone significantly underreported, domestic violence being the most obvious example, and in recent years hate crimes have clearly been underreported, which is why we have been seeking to encourage increased reporting to ensure that they are addressed appropriately. But as far as the generality of crimes is concerned, I am not sure that there is any greater underreporting now than was the case a few years ago. Mrs. Pam Cameron for a question. Thank you. Question number four, please. It is important to offer appropriate interventions aimed at changing the behaviour of those committing domestic abuse. The Integrated Domestic Abuse Programme ensures a consistent approach in providing interventions for perpetrators of domestic violence. IDAP has been delivered by the Probation Board since 2009. The primary aims of this programme are to identify, challenge and change men's abusive behaviour. IDAP is currently delivered in five sites, Armagh, Ballymena, Belfast, Derry and Oma. In providing the programme, the Probation Board works in close collaboration with the Police Service, Social Services and Women's Aid to manage risk constructively. Importantly, the programme also offers safety and support services to victims through women's safety services provided by Women's Aid. I understand that a full evaluation of the IDAP programme by the Probation Board is underway and I look forward to receiving the report. I am aware that in England the National Offender Management Service has replaced IDAP with a new accredited programme building better relationships. To accre achieve accreditation, programmes must be evidence-based to ensure they are targeting the right people, focusing on the right things and are being delivered in a way that is most likely to reduce reoffending. All NOMS accredited programmes are monitored to ensure programme integrity. I understand that the Probation Board is committed to delivering accredited programmes and as a result plans to follow this same approach. Mrs Cameron for supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Given that the funding for the Women's Safety Worker associate, associated with IDAP uh, for perpetrators has been withdrawn without notice, how will this programme continue to be accredited and do you as Minister recognise that this totally unsafe practice places victims of domestic violence at uh, an increased risk? Well, I appreciate the point Ms. Mrs Cameron is making, Deputy Speaker. Um, sadly, it seems to be the case and in virtually every question I answer these days, I point out the realities of the financial circumstances we live in. Despite those difficulties, I certainly believe that the Probation Board, which has the specific responsibility in this area, is doing its best within the financial circumstances it sits to manage programmes such as IDAP and indeed to look at the potential transformation across. So whilst there are undoubtedly challenges because of the budget reductions, I believe there's also a lot of very good work being done by professionals right across the justice system, which we ought to be supporting, whilst recognising the pressures that this sometimes places on individual members of staff. Mrs Sandra over it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for answers uh, thus far. Would the Minister um, support minimum sentencing uh, for those found guilty of domestic abuse related crimes? Well, I stick to the general position on virtually every offence, Deputy Speaker, that the reason why we have judges uh, producing sentencing decisions after court hearings, at whatever level of court they take place, is so that all the relevant factors can be taken into account and on that basis legislating for minimum sentences can be an incredibly blunt instrument which doesn't actually meet the needs of providing a safer society and protecting our people. So on that basis, no, I am not in support of mandatory minimum sentences. Ms Michaela Boyd. Good. Um, Minister, uh, I appreciate the, the answers that you have given thus far, but Minister, um, are you satisfied that there, that there are sufficient resources to deal with the programmes related to domestic violence? Gormagan. 
Well, Deputy Speaker, I do not have any suggestion that there are specific problems around the issue of resources for these particular programmes. What is absolutely clear is that there are resource issues for the justice system as a whole, and we seek in the Department to manage the resources across different programmes within different agencies as best we can, given the problems that we, uh, we are falling under. But frankly, as long as this House fails to take a realistic attitude to some of the difficult decisions that need to be taken over funding generally, and ministers will continue to answer questions about difficulties within particular programmes. Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, do you share uh, my concern that many women who have experienced uh, domestic violence at the hands of former paramilitaries feel coerced into silence because they are being told by other paramilitaries within their, their communities that if they were to report the crime to the police, that that then will have an impact on uh, the early release uh, that many of them are uh, subject to. And therefore, Minister, will you undertake to write to the Secretary of State to clarify whether or not a conviction of domestic abuse would put uh, under threat uh, their early release? Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, whilst Mrs Kelly makes some valid points about the way issues are treated, and in particular how we support victims of a variety of offences, and those who would carry out um, activities which would threaten people in general. Uh, we need to be slightly cautious about giving specific commitments on that. I'm certainly happy to discuss the issue wider with her, because there are issues which need to be discussed. Frankly, issues of the behaviour of paramilitaries, which have rather hit the headlines in recent weeks and months. Uh, there is a wider issue to, you know, to address there. I'm quite happy to have a discussion a bit longer than just giving a quick snap answer at this stage. Mr. Trevor Lund for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question five, Minister. I have regular discussions with the Chief Constable about a range of issues, including parading and protests and their implications. I met the Chief Constable and his senior colleagues last month and plan to review the situation with him again before the 12th of July parades. I recognize and welcome the fact that the vast majority of parades in Northern Ireland pass off without any difficulty. I recognise the rights of both those who seek to parade within the law and those who, of those who wish to protest peacefully, but there is no cause, dispute or disagreement that justifies the use of violence or public disorder. Those who are involved in such behaviour need to recognise and understand the potential consequences of their behaviour, including through the courts. I hope that wise heads will prevail this year, that true leadership will be shown and that we can all see a peaceful summer. Mr Lund for supplementary. As I thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Would, would he agree with me that in the absence of political agreement and to establish mechanisms for the regulation of parades, that all parties and political leaders should encourage people to abide by parades commission decisions, thereby upholding the law, whether they agree with them or otherwise? Well, yes, I certainly agree with my colleague. The reality is the Parades Commission is the body which is established by Parliament to deal with issues of parades and protests. This assembly or the parties in this assembly have been unable to agree any appropriate replacement uh, for the Parades Commission and therefore the Parades Commission remains the body established by law to take the difficult decisions which we have been unable to take on for institutions established by this assembly and therefore I believe it is incumbent upon every MLA as indeed every citizen to uphold the determinations of the Parades Commission, accept them whether or not they like them, and live within them to ensure that we can have a peaceful society and a peaceful summer marching season. Mr. Martin O'Mullier for supplement. Last Concordia, I thank the Minister for looking forward with some optimism to the summer, and I share that optimism, but he would look back and tell us what the financial cost has been to his department and to his community of policing the flag protests and the uh, demonstration at Twiddell uh, Avenue in North Belfast? Well, I can't give Mr O'Mullier the full statistics for policing flags protests. Um, it certainly was the case not that long ago that it was costing uh, close on £1 million per month to police 10 metres at the top of Twiddell Avenue every evening. Um, because there's been some reduction in resources, it is now running at something less than that. I believe it's something in the region of a third of a million pounds per month. But all of that is money which is either being spent in additional overtime, which is creating pressures on police officers and on the police budget, or it is um, a cost 
by officers being redeployed from other duties, including the basic everyday crime fighting and public reassurance that members frequently tell me they wish to see in their constituencies. It may only be an opportunity cost, but it is nonetheless a significant cost. Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that the recent visit by Prince Charles uh, to St. Patrick's Church in uh, Donegal Street uh, was a recognition uh, by Prince Charles that, in fact, such an institution and such a building should be respected by all, and that includes the loyal orders, and that people should learn the lesson from the Prince that uh, there should be mutual respect in our society, uh, not just by those involved in parades, but those who also protest. Well, I certainly agree with the tenor of Mr McGuinness's comments, Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure it should actually require a visit by a member of the royal family for people in this society to respect places of worship. But the very fact that he did visit it should surely encapsulate the historic nature of the church and the specific issues. Um, I've attended services there on two or three occasions related to different aspects of the justice system, including most recently for prison weeks last November. And I believe that any place of worship which is providing a service to the community as well as its pastoral care and concern for its parish or congregation should be respected by everybody in this society, and in particular, recent determinations of the Parades Commission regarding respect for that particular place of worship should be upheld. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister refers to the Ardoin Twiddell area. Does the Minister not accept that it's very difficult to get a localised agreement in that area when the two residence groups apparently uh, won't meet in the same room together? Well, Deputy Speaker, whether or not there is a difficulty in getting agreement in the area, the question I was asked was around the issue of upholding Praise Commission determinations, and that was the point which I made absolutely clear. Certainly, uh, matters might be easier in the ardoin twiddell area uh, if those on both sides of that particular dispute in the different factions and elements on both sides of that dispute you know, were to engage together and engage constructively. But, but the fundamental issue is people should uphold the law, especially those who belong to organisations which claim to be committed to upholding the law and the constitutional arrangements. Call Mr Robin Swan for a question. Question number six. I met with the Prison Officers Association Chair and a number of his colleagues in December 2014 to discuss a range of issues including staffing levels and staff safety. Officials within the prison service continue to meet staff representatives through the formal Whitley structures and informally engage with both trade unions and staff via a range of communication and engagement strategies. NIPS keeps staffing levels under review and a reef profiling exercise looking comprehensively at operational staffing levels across the service is nearing completion. As part of this exercise, there is an agreed process to consult with representatives of the POA prior to the introduction of the new profiles. There is a range of ways staff morale is kept under review, including mechanisms which facilitate staff engagement with senior management. This is done at local level with full staff briefings and as part of the frontline forum meetings. The Director General and the Director of HR visit each prison specifically for frontline forum meetings, which bring together a cross section of staff in addition to the regular visits to the prisons by the leadership team. Mr. Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that, but can I ask him what practical measures he's actually put in place over the last year to resolve the low staff, and, low staff and complement and also the high number of staff that are currently off on sick leave? Well, there are two specific issues there, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, in the first case, in order to ensure that there are appropriate staffing ratios, uh, there is a certain amount of overtime has been worked, and there are also issues in terms of managing at times controlled uh, lockdowns, which would not otherwise have been anticipated in, in order to ensure st safety for staff and for prisoners. Uh, it is the job of managers in each part of the prison, um, in conjunction uh, with their colleagues in HR, to ensure that the general issue of sickness absence is addressed. As indeed members are well aware, it's an issue which applies right across the Northern Ireland Civil Service. 
That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Topical question one has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the impact of the withdrawal of professional legal aid services and how it has impacted on the justice system in Northern Ireland? Well, the answer to this stage, Deputy Speaker, is that there has been very limited impact from the withdrawal of legal aid services. Uh, the current period of withdrawal uh, only uh, commenced uh, at the beginning of May, and therefore there have been relatively few cases affected by that. I do know of one case uh, where an individual who was not represented in court uh, succeeded in achieving bail on her own account by being invited to make her own representations uh, by the judge hearing the application for bail, uh, so it certainly didn't have any effect on her. And the issue of the number of cases which have been affected uh, is relatively limited and will not kick on uh, until uh, into the autumn term when we will see matters. I certainly hope that, uh, that those who have currently said they are withdrawing their services will reconsider the issue, especially when it comes to the time when the two professional bodies are actually judicially reviewing the decision that I took. Mr Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Has the Minister made any progress on the use of the proposed Legal Defender Service for the management of legal cases in Northern Ireland? Well, I'm not sure what the proposed use of a Legal Defender Service is, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, it is an issue which is potentially available uh, in our legislative provision. Uh, I have sought all along to ensure that we maintain the existing system which allows individuals to choose their legal team from those who work in private practice, and that is the current position. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, recently it has come to my attention through written questions that over £10 million has been spent in repair and maintenance work at HMP McGarvey over the last four years. Minister, can you detail and provide a clear explanation as to why this £10 million was needed for this work? Yes, Deputy Speaker, I was aware that Mr Anderson was aware of this, given the way he ran to the press to talk about what he um, described as a fairly excessive um, budget, budget spend um, on the issue. Sadly, he didn't actually check up on the facts in the first place, because if we compare, for example, the maintenance spend at McGabry with that in modern Scottish prisons, we find that McGabry in 2014-15 spent on general property maintenance £22.50 per square metre, and the Scottish prison spent £28 per square metre. Indeed, uh, since devolution, we've seen the overall cost of maintenance at McGabry reduced by over 38%. So perhaps Mr Anderson might like to ask his colleague, the MP for Upper Ban, to ask the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland what went wrong before devolution. Call Mr. Anderson for a supplementary. Okay, I'm being asked questions now, but uh, you know, this whole thing there was £400,000 also spent in what was termed by the department, your department, as a small amount, uh, Minister, and I don't think that was any small amount by any stretch of the imagination. So we, we need to know how and why it was spent. And, Minister, do, do you not agree with me that these high cost highlights an even, an even bigger problem within the service? Uh, which is that the prisons are seriously understaffed. And if, it, if you do agree with me in this, which is felt by many, is that the safety of prison officers uh, has been compromised. Well, sorry, Deputy Speaker. I've just told Mr Anderson that costs are going down, and now he asks me to agree with him that the high costs mean there's a problem. So I will accept his logic entirely and accept that the prison service is getting better. Thank you. Call Mr. William Irwin for a topical question. Uh, order, order, please. To my right here, are insisting on speaking from a senator position, and that means I can't either hear the members who are asking the questions, and perhaps more important, I can't hear the minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Whilst welcoming the Minister's recent announcement in relation to increased support to victims of crime through the Victims of Crime Fund, can I ask what portion of the funding will be allocated specifically to supporting and helping elderly and vulnerable 
victims of crime, particularly those who have been burgled in their own home? Well, Deputy Speaker, it wouldn't be possible to give the figures at that level of detail, um, given that the funding is being delivered through some of the voluntary sector partners that we have um, who deal with this uh, issue, particularly Victim Support and the NSPCC, and therefore I couldn't say how we could possibly break that down. It would be a requirement to find it from the, the voluntary groups. I'm not sure it would be a terribly good use of their resources to chase up that level of detail rather than asking them to provide the services. Commissioner Irwin for supplementary. Okay, I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister accept that elderly and vulnerable who have been victims of crime in their own homes uh, do feel very vulnerable and should be worthy of uh, funding? I, I certainly accept that there are a number of older people in this society who feel vulnerable, even though statistics show the 2 per cent of violent crime is, is directed against older people who constitute 16 per cent of the population. But there is no doubt that there are fears of issues like domestic burglaries, and that is why a lot of work has been done, principally under the auspices of PCSPs right across Northern Ireland, to provide various security aids, and indeed I visited some of those schemes in a number of different areas. We see good work being done in that respect, and it's certainly something I am keen to encourage, including using uh, the proceeds of criminal assets uh, to help fight crime where, you know, where appropriate local organisations can assist in installing and providing the kind of equipment which can help provide that reassurance. People should be aware that the risks to older people in this society are actually very low, but there is no doubt that the fear of crime amongst older people remains at a fairly high level. I call Mr Sammy Douglas for a topical question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister mentioned earlier on about the prison service and FE colleges. Um, could the Minister outline what sort of work the Youth Justice Agency has done to date to develop strategic partnerships with the um, Department of Education, particularly for the under-18s? Well, yes, Mr Douglas raises a, you know, an entirely valid point, and very similar work is going on um, at the moment around Woodlands Juvenile Justice Centre. I met uh, with John O'Dowd as Education Minister at Woodlands a few weeks ago as we look to see how we improve the quality of teaching which can be provided there, uh, because there is no doubt that there are difficulties for the Youth Justice Agency in employing teachers, uh, uh, specifically in terms of some of the external services that those teachers are able to access, because they're not teachers in a recognised institution. And uh, officials have been looking at that from the two departments. I don't yet have a conclusion on it, but I would hope that we'll see something fairly speedily. Call Mr Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Or Deputy Speaker. And again, um, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me. We're talking about some of the most uh, vulnerable young people in our society. And would the Minister agree to keep a house informed of developments with the Woodlands? I certainly will, Deputy Speaker. I think probably um, one of the, uh, the best opportunities we have um, is the, uh, by use of the education other than at school scheme, uh, which potentially would allow Woodlands to be recognised as an education provider, and that would mean, for example, that staff there would have access to professional training courses which they currently don't have access to because they're not employed in an appropriate place. But I'll certainly keep the House in general and Mr Douglas in particular informed of that. Question six has been withdrawn. I call Mr Samuel Gardner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister accept that through changes to neighbourhood policing across the ABC Council, that policing in the Banbridge and Craigavon areas have been run down? Well, I have two difficulties in responding to that, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the first of which is the fundamental one, is this is an issue for the Chief Constable, uh, for the Policing Board, for the new PCSP, which will shortly be established in the ABC Council, and that would be the appropriate place uh, to discuss those issues rather than from my part as Minister, because I suspect if I did too much of that conversation, I would be seen by the Chief Constable and by others to be interfering in his responsibilities and those of the Policing Board, and I wouldn't wish to come across members of the Policing Board, especially those in this House. The supplementary will be more direct, Mr Gardner. I hope so. Thank you again, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister needs to accept some accountability for this. He works with the PSNI on a daily basis, does the Minister accept that the neighbourhood policing 
connects the police with the population on the ground and that his decision has only put greater distance between the police officers and the community they are here to serve. I'm slightly perturbed by the, by the, the phrase, his decision, Deputy Speaker, because it appeared that it was referring to a decision of mine. The only decision that I have taken in terms of the provision of resources for neighbourhood policing in Banbridge, Craigavon, or anywhere else in Northern Ireland is the decision to protect the budget of the police service to the best extent I can by only making cuts of 5.7% in the policing budget this year as against the 22% cuts being made in the core Department of Justice. So I don't believe that I have taken any decision which has made those matters worse. But there is no doubt, as I've said earlier, and will doubtless say in future occasions, that the difficult financial situation makes it difficult for a range of public agencies to provide the service that the public is used to. Mr. Declan McAleer for a topical question. Uh, um, in light of the, the, the tragic death of Tyrone teenager uh, Ronan Hughes, can the Minister outline what measures his department has taken to highlight the dangers um, facing young people using the internet and social media sites? Well, it is certainly an issue which we should be concerned about of that level of tragic death. And a lot of work has been done around uh, issues related to the internet, although they are principally because of the, you know, the telecommunications aspect, reserve matters. But good work has been done involving the police service. A lot of educational work is being done through a variety of different organizations. And certainly I would trust that that particular tragic death would, as Ronan's parents have made it, become an issue to ensure that young people are made aware of the dangers of the internet and are protected from those who would harm them on it. Mr. McAleer, for a supplement. Um, would the Minister share the view that these fake accounts, which are believed to be, op to be operated by international criminal gangs, need to be tackled? Well, yes, Deputy Speaker, they, they most certainly need to be tackled. Um, as is highlighted by Mr. McAleer, uh, when we are talking about uh, gangs which are operating from other jurisdictions and targeting young people in these islands, it's very difficult to ensure that they are tackled easily, but there are wider issues. And I would, of course, highlight that this is one of those matters where there's limited expertise within Northern Ireland because of the specialist nature of it, but we at least now benefit from the input of the National Crime Agency in helping us fight these criminals. Call Mr. Leslie Cree for a topical question. Deputy Speaker, what is the Minister's assessment of Sakir Starmer's report on the independent review of the prosecution of related sexual abuse and terrorism cases? Well, of course, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's not entirely for me uh, to give an assessment of the Keir Starmer report. It is an issue for the Director of Public Prosecutions to follow through. I welcome the fact that he has accepted the report in full. I welcome the fact that he has apologised to the victims. And I welcome the, thought that he, the, uh, the point that he is clearly putting into train actions within the Public Protection Service uh, to make those necessary changes. Uh, I had a brief discussion uh, with the DPP before the report was published, and I then had a subsequent discussion with him last week. And I have no doubt that he is taking the report seriously and is ensuring that the Public Pro uh, Prosecution Service learns from it. Mr. Cree for a supplementary. Yes, uh, thank the Minister for that. But bearing in mind the outcome of the report, does the Minister not think that the Director of Public Prosecution should have resigned? Well, no, Deputy Speaker, I don't for the very simple uh, reasons that the Director of Public Prosecutions was not in post at the time when these issues first came up and was not the person taking the decisions. What I think is much more important is rather than calling for resignations to ensure that organisations learn the lessons from reports such as this. Ms. Katrina Ruan, first topic. Sir Margaret, the last can call you. And um, does the Minister believe that revelations by Panorama programme affects confidence in policing? And we have a further programme tonight in prime time. Well, Deputy Speaker, I might be in serious danger of um, pre, uh, pre-empting a debate which we're due to have in this House shortly if I went too far into that detail. There is no doubt the revelations in Panorama. Um, in the subsequent local programme um, and potentially in prime time uh, will cause people to have concerns about the behaviour of a number of organisations 
in the past. I do not believe that they should have any effect on confidence in policing today because we see today a very different police service which is fully accountable to the policing board, of which Ms. Rowan is a member, which has the highest human rights standards and which is operating in a way which is in a very different place from the circumstances which applied in the 1970s and 1980s. I'm sorry, time is up. There isn't time for a supplementary.